Hey, welcome to the Extra Podcast. This is a monumental episode. This is a big day. Not often do podcasts last this long and, and tread this deep and and uh, carry on. Like this extra podcast has carried on over the years. In of season, out of season. We've seen people come, we've seen people go, and now we've arrived at episode 350. And uh, I'm, I'm joined just by Jeff Bucknam, the only Jeff. No one else is here. I, I was going to say, for, no episode, for episode 350, everyone left. Everyone left. But that's good. More time for us, right? Mm-hmm. Daniel, you and me, mono Jeff, this is just, e mono. This is just a conversation, is all it is. It's just a conversation. And we're inviting our church and our worldwide listeners in on this conversation. Okay, let's let's converse. Let's converse. Um, first of all, that's a big congratulations. Pause. <laughs> do you have anything you want to say? No, no. Oh, is well, your birthday? Tell you, tell you, well, it's well. I do want to say one thing that apparently I just learned uh, prior to us recording that it is your twenty fourth birthday tomorrow. That's right. Congratulations, Jeff. Daniel. Can you sing me happy birthday on the twenty fourth birthday? Did you know that my son's number in baseball for years has been twenty four? That's right. Did you also know that Ken Griffey Jr.'s number in baseball was twenty four? Did you also know that Willie May's number was twenty four? Did you know that Tom Chambers? Number for the Seattle Supersonics was 24. Mm. Did you know this? That Kobe Bean Bryant's is number 24. 24. And that Kiefer eight. Sutherland was in a show called 20. So you're, my point here is that you're in good company with 24. Thanks, Jeff. And I think it's fantastic. 24 years old. So, wow. So you are uh, six years prior, right? Now you got six years left. Uh, to be compared with Jesus when he began his ministry. So how's that was going? Was he 30? I thought he was 33. Uh, he's 33 when he, when he was crucified oh, yeah. and rose again. So how but, am I doing? But how you doing? You, you think in about six years, you'll be able to, you'll be able to match our Lord Jesus and, uh, in, in his maturity and ability? Not. No, no, nope. I don't, I think, don't so. think so. But you know what? That's all right. Six, the next six years of your life are going to be a pretty important thing. That's right. Man, I'll tell you what. When I was 23, if I knew what I know now, yeah, give me some of that wit wisdom from the well, Jeff. Tell me some of this. If you could go back and, and do it all again, or you, you're looking at, okay, right now, you and me, this, this conversation, yep. you are looking at me. I am. You're looking at you, okay? Yeah. I'm, you're 24. Yeah. What do you say to you? Get a haircut. That's number one, right? Because I got to tell you, man, this, this, I think I like your hair. I do. You got a lot of it, mm. right? But uh, nobody's going to take you seriously with the long hair. Hmm. They just aren't. Name name people who have long hair. Men who have long hair who have been taken seriously. Go ahead. Samson. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> John the Baptist. Totally. Paul. But they had a beard. And you didn't you don't have a beard. But I'm not thirty yet. Why don't you <laughs> if you grow a beard, can you grow one? No, I can't. No, it's kind of I'm all patchy. I'm yeah. Okay. It's not it's not cool. You know, okay, what, I else, what else you got in the world? I, I gotta tell you what, I when I was 24, I was not as teachable as I ought to have been. Hmm. I probably still am not as teachable as I ought to be. But when I was 24, I, I struggled. I, I was in seminary at the time. And I, while I was in seminary, I remember being frustrated with some of the things I was being taught by the professors, which was, and when I say that, I wasn't because they were teaching me things that were contrary to the doctrine that I had grown up learning. I just I don't know. I just kind of had this attitude like, oh, I don't need this. and nah, I could should go on and take my little, my, my little uh, squirt gun and put out all the fires in the world. And as I look back now, I was so ill-equipped. Not suggesting that you are, Daniel. It's just that, uh, you know, in professional sports, like at 24, you might actually almost be retired. Yeah. Okay. But in every other walk of life, it you are you're just starting, barely starting, yeah, barely barely starting. But I do think that because so many uh, professional athletes and stuff are 24, and that those who we think super highly of and are kind of in their early 20s, mid 20s, and we talk about that as being like p- their peak years. I think that kind of pervades the culture at large, and so as a result, a lot of young young people end up feeling like, my goodness, I'm 24, I don't know anything, and I, I should be doing big things, and so I got to get out get get going. I got to go change the world. Actually, I, I would say, you, you, no, you don't. You, you need to, you need to become well equipped and you need to be humble and learn from lots of people who've gone before you. Because honestly, uh, 
honestly, you need all the help you can get. Yep. Yeah. Which, I, of course, you know that. I feel that. Yeah. I feel that all the time. I feel so under-equipped, even for this job, right? Because I didn't go to a Bible school before. No, you went to... A, I did a college degree. You went uh, to a real college. History. Yeah, I did history. And then it was a Christian school. Christian, Christian school, Christian but it was school like uh, you did a fake air quotes there. Yeah, it, it was very liberal. Translate well, Christian radio, theological but. liberalism school. Anyways, no, I did a history degree there. Yeah, but so coming into this though, I don't have like a a basis for uh, like I have what I've learned in church and what I've studied on my own, but not like a four years of interacting with the Bible and theology and history of the church. So it's all, I feel like I'm playing catch up all the time. Yeah, yeah. so I I always quite feel humbled. Oh, good. In most areas, so. That's all right. But you know what? You'll look back at 24 someday, and you'll think to yourself, man, I can't believe they gave me a microphone. Yeah. And at that point, you'll be thinking the same thing that everybody who's listening to us right now. I can't believe right? that. I can't believe they gave him. We made it to episode. No, I can't believe they gave him a microphone. Yeah. I can't believe we've been <laughs> on for 350 episodes. Yeah. That's what I can't believe. So, well... Let's, uh, that, that was good, Jeff. That was some good wisdom from the well. And, uh, you know, maybe next year on my birthday. <laughs> we'll we give you can, some more. Next year in 25, though, you'll be able to rent a, a car a, a car without having to pay the underage uh, fees. That's true. So you know that, what? Yeah. And I, every single birthday of mine has been really inconsequential because when I turned 19, you know, the drinking age, yeah. uh, I was in America. Uh, so so it didn't tw- count. I couldn't, didn't count there. Then when I turned uh, 21, I was in England. Yeah. Which the drinking age is eighteen. So yeah. So I never. Um, yeah, it just every birthday's kind of felt inconsequential. Yeah. yeah. I never really cared about the drinking age. You know why, Daniel? Why, Jeff? Because I'm a Christian mm. and I don't drink. Mm. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Hey, um, we were we were talking before this a little bit about something really in our culture in Canada that has touched the soul of Canada. Yeah. And we didn't, we didn't actually talk about it last week, which would have been great having Ezra here, but we want to talk about, uh, Humboldt and the hockey team and mm. the bus crash. Have you been to Humboldt? You ever been? No, I've mm-hmm. never been. No. I've been to Saskatchewan. I've been to Wadena, Saskatchewan yeah. and, and Saskatoon. But, uh, I mean, this, this story has touched, I think everybody in Canada. And you were saying like you're, you're American and you're kind of, you know, you've lived in Canada for a while now. Yeah. About 12 years. Yeah. Yeah. But, Still, still a little bit of an outsider there. My mother, mother's Canadian, and mm. uh, so like my my uh, grandfather, who I did not know, he passed away before I was born. But like he he was a he was a hockey player. Def- he was a defenseman for a team in Prince Edward Island, and um, I was not aware of how important. I mean, I knew, of course, people everybody watches hockey, right? They their local team and stuff like that. Mm. I did not know how much a part of the the cultural fabric hockey was in particular, but especially j- junior hockey about yeah. uh, of that's the thing that's not surprised me, but I've learned a lot about Canada as a country recently, just because of how much this story has, has touched people, which by the way, I mean, it should touch people. It's a, it's, it's so, it's a horribly sad mm-hmm. story. There's nobody I know of ever, ever who, who uh, laughs or, scoffs or like even dismisses in any way the the horrible situation that these families are facing yeah. and uh that town in in and of itself and, and 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 to be honest with you almost all small towns in the middle of of uh in, in the middle of canada because you know i was out in saskatchewan and, and you go from one to the next and i can see you know you when i heard about the location where the uh, we're not sure still what happened exactly, yeah. but like where the, the truck hit the bus or the bus hit the truck that, that there was a, I've been like when I was driving out in Saskatchewan, like I've been through those types of those spots yeah. and, um, you know, I have kids and they travel on buses and stuff. Yeah. Uh, and so it's, it just touches the heart of, of everyone and so deeply sad. And I've, I've, along with so many other Canadians have prayed uh, repeatedly, in fact, for those yeah. families and for the those involved in it, I, my heart it goes out to the bus driver and to the driver of the of the other car, and I, yeah. these sorts of things happen. Uh, Did the bus driver survive? I I don't know. I'm sorry. Yeah. So like, if I say yeah. that, and see, I don't it, know much. It might be. I, I haven't followed it entirely. Partly, mm-hmm. partly because honestly, when I look, I looked at it online and I see stories about it. I find it so sad as a father of a 
17 year old boy myself yeah. to, to think about how heartbreaking it would be to lose your, lose, lose your child. Yeah. And, uh, I, I have been, I asked a friend the other day, I, try, respectfully, I, I said, this is just an American speaking. And again, like th- this, this has touched this country m- more like everybody than anything I think I experienced when I was growing up in the U.S., any one particular event did. I mean, some of their school about, shooting, school you, shooting Columbine maybe was the only other time that I... What about 9-11? You weren't in well, America nine, for No, that, I was. Were yeah, I you was were there. there for here? 9-11 as well. But like, again, 9-11 was a, planes landing into buildings that yeah. ended up... Two of the biggest buildings in the world that ended up collapsing on top of people. Yeah. And this is about a, a, a bus being hit in, in the middle of Saskatchewan. And so like, mm. uh, in terms of like na- national coverage... The first of those has was covered way more, so I that's why I was saying that the the things that have affected a nation for my for my experience have been far larger mm-hmm. than this. The closest though that I I have come into my mind to it is what happened in I think it was ninety nine nineteen ninety nine when the Columbine shootings happened, yeah. and I think what touched Americans so much about that was the fact that everybody sends their kids to school. Yep. Right. And that everybody knows, like whenever they heard about these guys walking around the school shooting and going into the library, everybody pictured because everybody sat in. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know. Well, everybody sat the in high bus, school I'm like, I've ridden how many team buses yeah. for football and whatnot. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Do you know what's crazy? Like this story um, could have, I have a personal connection to this in that my cousin, I think he's like 17 or 18, was drafted by Humboldt. Oh, wow. And he was on that team. But he got called up to the the next division up, yeah. and and actually finished the playoffs with the with the division up. Oh. Had he not finished and maybe got Paul, called back down and played with Humboldt, he would have been on the bus. Been on the bus. Oof. So yeah. it's just yeah, it's yeah. pretty it's pretty intense. But sorry, I kind of no. It's it it seemed in Abbotsford what a couple of years ago I think with this the stabbing happened at, yeah. at Abbey uh, Senior. Mm-hmm. And that touches the hearts of people too, of course, because it's because it's it's something that we've all experienced and we've been there. And it seems so no, it's such a normal thing to do to get on a bus and ride across to a, to a hockey tournament, and then mm-hmm. to have that be your last. I, I will tell you that I hugged my kids tighter mm-hmm. that day, and it does make. I told my kids and my wife uh, just at dinner. I think it was last night or the night before how much I they mean to me and that sort of thing. And I do think that this, if anything, should should probably point us in that kind of direction to realize that, uh, some, it, it, you know, tragedy happens in the moments where we don't expect it to happen. Yeah. Of course, it's what makes it tragedy. But I think sometimes we just go along with our lives so much that we st- we don't stop and actually speak to those we love about what we think about them and share with them the things that really matter to us. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, it's one of those moments, I think, that should remind all of us to stop and to pause and thank God for the people he has in our lives and these sort these sorts of things. Yeah. Uh, you know, Jesus you, told a story just as an yeah. aside, you know, cause he, you know, this sort of thing happened in the, in biblical times, right? Yeah. When I, obviously like buses crashing into but disasters, but whatever, like disasters yeah. and stuff happen. Accidents. And so the questions that of course we raise are the same questions they raised in the scripture. So Luke 13, he mm-hmm. talks about the tower of Siloam following on, falling on some, so some Jews, and when Jesus said that, he, he, you know, it was just a great tragedy that really touched the the lives of so many people there. Jesus' comment to the people there was, you know, you should reflect at this moment about whether or not, you know, because our thing is, oh, why did this happen to them? But Jesus actually turns a little bit of that on its head, and he 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 says the question actually is, why doesn't it happen to you? That God yeah. actually is being patient with us so that we will repent and he's being patient with us so that we will express our gratitude to him. And, and I, I, again, the Lord is frequently keeping us from car accidents and frequently keeping us safe yeah. in the normal everyday actions of our lives, right? He keeps the breath in our lungs and most of the time we're healthy. And I, it, the, these are the things that we ought to be thanking him for his common graces that he shows on us over and over again, regardless of whether or not we believe in him or don't. Right. He causes yeah. the rain to fall on the just and the unjust alike. And yeah. so even in the midst of something like this, I want to give praise to God for all the ways that he has sustained and is sustaining people uh, in the midst of this, this horrible tragedy. And mm-hmm. it doesn't mean that there aren't questions that remain in my mind about like why and of course, of course, those questions yeah. remain, but they are questions that I think can get, can be put 
a little bit on the back burner or given some sort of uh, context when we do think and reflect a little bit about the character of God and how good he has been to all of us for so long, even those of us who blaspheme him all the time. So that's one aspect of it, but for the people going through the grief right now, how, how is God glorified in that? (laughs) Yeah. Well, my hope is, and prayer has been actually that the local church will be a great source of help to them. Uh, I was really thankful to hear uh, some of the words that were being spoken at the at some of the memorial stuff, uh, I, I thank God for the. I can't remember the name of the of the pastor who who is the mm-hmm. chaplain to it. But you never know when you're going to get thrust into national attention. To be honest with you, yeah. and he had. It was I, I was reminded of you know biblical passages that talk about you know you know uh, Moses supposed to go in front of Pharaoh and he's freaked out and God says I'm going to give you the words to say when yeah. you get there, you know and I. Th- I felt very much like the Lord had had blessed him yeah. with the ability to speak to a national audience at that moment. At that moment, and I thank God for him for his yeah. faithfulness, and certainly thank God for for God and for His ability to help us pastors in times of great tragedy have the right words because sometimes it it is a very difficult thing to make sense of. You know? Yeah, and I mean sometimes we don't have words. But how good is it? We can just read the word, you know, yeah. and, and that's all we need at yeah. times. Like when, when words don't work, that's, that's a source of comfort. Yeah. For and a I've lot said, of people. you know, it's these sorts of situations uh, that tend to divide those who believe from those who do not. Uh, and the, the, I'm, what I mean by that is the response that they have to that. And I've shared that before in our podcast that we, we tend to be those who either shake their fist at heaven in judgment or uh, bow our heads before heaven and pound our chest to say, have mercy on me. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and I, even though I have big questions about God and about why the world functions the way it does, I have huge questions. I mean, I was a history major too, and I have huge questions about all of those things. Mm-hmm. And those are good questions to investigate and to ask and to seek out. And the Lord has provided some answers to them, or at least some semblance of an answer to some of them. But I also know that, uh, regardless of my questions and my lack of understanding all of his ways, God is sovereign and he is good and he's working out his purposes in the world. Mm. And even even this kind of tragedy fits within that framework. Uh, what the church needs to do in this present moment, though, and the way that God is going to be most glorified is not with the theological answers. Uh, the church is going to be most glorified, and or sorry, God is going to be most glorified is when the church actually shows the love of Christ to these folks. Yeah. And points out that Jesus too is a sufferer. Mm. So I, yeah, again, our, my heart and our hearts together go out to uh, those suffering because of this. And some of them are far off, right? They're people who are who weren't even affected by it, yeah. you know, like personally. Yeah. So yeah. Oh man. Um, yeah, because it has the potential of being one of those things where the the country itself will look at the address given by that pastor, and they might actually think. Uh, better about Christians by watching their suffering and their response. And that's kind of where I want to go now Yeah, is uh, we talked before this, uh, before this, we started doing this live show <laughs> to the masses. You, you, um, you were reading an article this past week uh, yeah. about uh, that people typically have thought pretty moderately about Christians. Like they used to think really good about them, yeah. you know, like, Oh, Christians are great people. You know that if this guy's a Christian, he's going to show up for work on time. He has a nice yard. Like his family is, is in order for the most part. Uh, and, and then it's kind of transitioned to now they're more moderate. Like they think, Oh yeah, you know, like I don't mind having this guy around, yeah. but now it's starting to trend into a more negative. Could you yeah, explain that? Well, the author was, uh, making the argument that, uh, Prior to his, and his dates are arbitrary, I think, to some degree, although I think he probably has some reasons for, for establishing it. I just can't remember exactly what the reasons were. Prior to 1994, his argument was that the way that people in the West views Christians was largely positively, yeah. that, that to be a Christian in the 1980s was to be seen even by, uh, even, even by, you know, university faculty and by people from the, on the other side of the political aisle from you or whatever, though, to be to be a Christian was seen largely positively. You were a moral person. You were somebody who was adding something valuable to the society at large, right? Your viewpoints on things were were helping uh, people to live better, to be to flourish as humans. Yeah. 
His argument was that night from not so from 1994 to about 2014, he said that he he noticed and has tried to describe a shift from a positive view toward Christians from the culture to a more neutral view uh, that, okay, you used to be really, we used to think of you as really good people and great. And, but now we're sort of like, meh, it's kind of an indifference toward you. Uh, I think, I think some of that probably had to do with the, the rise of questions regarding the effect of, of uh, religion on people, you know, people flew, religious people were the ones who flew their yeah. planes into the world trade center. Exactly. So as a result, man, can we really trust the religious? And, but it's that, you know, they're still nice people like my Christian neighbors are, seems like a nice person, but I also have questions about how can you be religious like religious? And, and if you are religious, man, please be the kind of religious that's like not really. Yeah. Because the really religious again are the suicide bombers the suicide, or and, the crusades. Right. And the, like this is, this has gone through history. Look what yeah. happens when you, so, but those kinds of questions came up more from 1994 to 2014 is what he argued. But still, kind of a neutral approach. His argument was in in that kind of neutral world, uh, certain kinds of ministries flourish, and one one of those ministry the f- ministries that flourish tend to be the Hillsongs of the world and the mm-hmm. and the Tim Keller's Redeemer Presbyterians of the world, where the assumption seems to be, and I'm I don't know if this is if you ask Tim Keller, who's the pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City, like if this is his view of the world, but. This author was saying the assumption seems to be that if we just explain Christianity well enough to the masses, there are a lot of people who are just going to either buy it or they're going to respect it. Yeah. Uh, explain it well. Like, yeah, if you're no, clear you have to, about no, things right. and you're, you're fair. Right. Because one of the things best about Tim Keller is he's just so uh, fair to all viewpoints. Right. right. And he, he's just very open. So if and, you're winsome, yeah. they'll, like, they'll like you. Yeah. I mean, the, the, you know what I mean? They, they're, they won't, they'll be, turn from, from, at the very least, from neutral to positive. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, he the, he also says Hillsong's one of those because it's you know a lot of a lot of lights and and show and all that sort of stuff. Which if there's nothing very welcoming. Fun, fundamentally, Hill, yeah, yeah. You ever go to a Hillsong church? You feel like the most. You feel like royalty. Yeah. Because you walk in and they welcome you like three people and right. you just feel like you're part of. And there's of, everything right with. The, by the way, this I explaining Christianity in winsome ways and welcoming people and even li- lights and all of yeah. that. I'm all for all that stuff. I really am. Yeah. Yeah. So, but the argument was that you have this, that those sorts of ministries tend to flourish uh, in a neutral setting. His argument, though, was that since 2014 in the West, especially in more progressive areas, like uh, when I pick progressive, I mean, I mean, politically progressive and, you know, city centers. Yeah, city centers, urban places and university campuses and mm-hmm. these sorts of places kind of that run by liberal elites yeah. uh, and in government that Christianity has gone from being a neutral thing to a negative thing. That actually now what you have is people saying that Christianity is evil. It's wicked because it has, because uh, it, it has sexual views that are oppressive to people. It's wicked for women because it's patriarchal in its core. They argue uh, it's, it's wicked regarding its well, it's uh, cruel because someone was murdered on a cross. Yeah. And exclusive it's exclusive because yeah. it says it's the only way the, all, the, all of these things are against what we believe in the modern world as being good, true and beautiful. Mm. And so it needs to not, you don't just put up with it. You, you oppose it, right? It needs to be fought back against. And so, um, that is far more akin to the first century and the way that Christianity was treated in the first century by the Roman world. Um, because in the Roman world, they believed that uh, Christians were, they used to call them cannibals because they ate the body and blood of Christ in their love feasts mm. is the language that was used. Right. And what do they do with their love feast? Anyone? They, anyway, they thought that it was just this disgusting. They call each other brother and sister and they have love with each other. So, yeah. like, you can hear the language. Well, and the jokes and, that you'd make, I mean, in our right. contemporary time, right? You could totally see that. And that's that what would they apply. did. They, they made the same kind of joke. They didn't know what was yeah. going on in yeah. those, in, in church service. All they had to do is show up yeah. to find out, but they didn't want to do that. They also called them atheists because they didn't believe in all the gods, they yeah. just believed in one. So, all of these kinds of things made Christians in the first century seen to be uh, evil, wicked, bad. And that, of course, led them to justifying certain acts against them, uh, persecutions of various stripes. So persecution of the worst stripe, right? On the, you know, uh, on a sliding scale of persecution, the worst kind is to kill you. Yeah. 
right? Just below that might be to steal your job from you or to make it so it's, you can't actually keep your work. Uh, physically beat you. Right, physically beat you, do all those sorts of things, yeah. even all the way down to kind of stink eye persecution, which is kind of what I think First Peter's about, which is they, they are looking weird at you and thinking you're, you're actually, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. Uh, you're an alien. Yes. And I think in this interesting thing though, the way that the world was affected in those early, so this guy's argument is right. That what he's trying to say is, look, the, the most a powerful kind of apologetic, the most powerful way that we're going to have an influence on the culture or when people to Christ is probably going to be acting very simply. It's probably the hospitality that Christians showed during the first century, the kinds of like the ki- kinds of commitments they had to the, the, uh, the down and out and the yep. poor and the oppressed, the lepers, the, they would go to them. Right. They would, I mean, if someone, there was a need, they'd pitch together to make it happen. At great and, personal risk to themselves yeah, and but cost listen, and personal cost. But they didn't do that to change the world. Mm-hmm. Okay. Do you understand that? This is what people are saying. Well, you have to do that to change the world. No, they didn't do it to change the world. That wasn't their intent. Their intent was to live out their faith no matter what. Right. And if it changed the world, fine. If it didn't change the world, fine. So Polycarp goes and he gets, you know, he gets put before, uh, you know, the Colosseum and everybody wants to have him killed. And if they tell him to recant or he's going to be fed to the lions and he's like, I'm not going to recant. I'm not going to do it. But his, his martyrdom, his death, that kind of commitment in the face of such, such danger uh, inspired a lot of people. Uh, and ch- and change the way they viewed things, and I'm, that's what I'm saying is that it, it's going to probably in the next number of years, if this guy's take on the way that culture at large is going in the West is right, in the next number of years, you're probably going to find that more, they're going to be more uh, the, the 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 best way for Christians to give testimony to the greatness of Jesus is to show him as greater than everything else they have. Mm. So if it costs me my job, so be it. If it costs me my money, so be it. If it costs me my life, so be it. Right? Yeah. That ultimately, that J- Jesus is worthy. And I, I can't help it. I think that that's the way that Christianity in, in uh, China has, has actually flourished. Yeah. I think that anytime you find a negative uh, cultural view toward Christianity, it actually tends to promote the growth of Christianity more than it does squash it. Would you say it also it purifies Christianity because it causes people to actually make a choice. Yeah, absolutely. They, they, they can't live as lukewarm. They have to live as... Oh, yeah. Uh, either. Why would you? Yeah. Why would you live as lukewarm? If you have to pinch some incense to Caesar, you just do it, and mm-hmm. which ends up outing you as being an idolater. Yeah. You know, you're actually just somebody who wants to, <laughs> you know, who just wants to save their skin mm-hmm. for whatever reasons. Mm-hmm. So in the end, either you're going to trust God with your future or you're, or you're not. What do you mean by the, sorry, the pinch the... Oh, back in the days, in order for, that was one of the ways that they used to have a thing called a libelous card. A libelous card was a, a sign that you were on the emperor's side. Mm. Uh, so the way you would get this one of these libelous cards is that you would uh, actually, in the, you'd, you'd take some incense and you would just kind of toss it on a candle, bow your head, and that was your way of. Oh, and the, above the candle was usually a some sort of fresco or a picture of the emperor. And this was a way for you to say, "No, I bow my I bow my head to the authority." And by authority, it's not just like the governmental authority; it's the he's a god authority <laughs> of the emperor. Christians saw that and said, "Wait a minute, there's only one true God." And we're not going to bow our heads to Caesar. Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. Yeah. And so they lived that way. That's why so many of them got killed, is yeah. that they were not willing to, to pinch their incense to Caesar, to basically give up on their confession. And so they didn't get this libelous card in the end. So we use that language yeah. nowadays. Oh, are you going to pinch the incense to Caesar? Have, you, have you seen the movie Silence? With, no. Uh, that's a good example kind of of that, where the yeah. guys are... You know, hey, you're free to live here and practice your religion as long as you step on the yeah. on the face of Christ, right? And they put the thing on the ground, and yeah. then, of course, the the priests are like, "Oh yeah, step on it." And then they're like, "Well, that's not good enough. Actually, spit on the cross, right?" right. And they stick a cross in front of them, and uh, the guys just they can't do it. They yeah. can't spit on like they cannot deny their savior, yeah. and so they die for it. It's powerful, right? And the thing the thing is that, that kind of commitment and willingness to keep going without repudiating the faith has an enormous power. And listen, I'm not, 
there's not probably not that many people in the West in the next 20, 30 years who are going to have to be put into that kind of situation. But yeah. I will say this, there are lots and lots of ways that we tend to be tempted to repudiate our faith and to, and to turn away from Christ in order to make our lives easier, uh, whether it be in our job because they're asking us to do things that are immoral or, or espouse things that we know the Bible says are different, but the culture at large says are true and good and beautiful. Mm-hmm. And we end up just going along because we're afraid of not uh, we're afraid of not having money to live. We're afraid of of what it might mean. But I think that the the th- this guy's kind of rubric, these three stages, is largely true from my experience and what I can just see anecdotally. And I think though that it probably promises a really good future for Christianity. Yeah. As it, you know, like some people look at that and say, "Isn't it sad?" And it is sad. And of course, we pray for God to to remove any kind of persecution for any Christians anywhere. But I will say again, that the Christian church has this weed-like quality and it tends to grow in, in places you don't expect it to grow. Yeah. And it flourishes when there's even when it looks like there's no water around. Yeah. You said something to me years ago that stuck with me, which was, uh, there's that passage. Is it, ah, oh, I don't know where it is, but the, the, the passage where the Lord was not in the wind. It's Elijah, right? Yeah. But the Lord was not in the fire. He was not in the earthquake. Yeah. Uh, explain that. Because you said, I think from yeah. what I remember, it's we expect God to be doing it, things in this oh, the way, story. the fire and the earthquake, but then he he's actually working behind the scenes it's in ways. It's a great ways. story, the one that, that comes from, like Elijah comes off the top, you know, he, he, he conquers the prophets of Baal. He comes off the mountain, Mount Carmel, Basically, Ahab says, "Meet me at my my place. I'm going to go talk to my wife because clearly the one the the one true God Yahweh is is the is the is the king." Mm-hmm. So he goes home, and Jezebel, who brought the worship of Baal into the land, uh, hears what Ahab has to say, and apparently one of the messengers comes out the door and says to Elijah, "You better run, boy, because she's going to kill you." So he's gone from thinking, great victory, all of the people in the land are going to repent. This is the moment my entire ministry has been leaning, has been headed toward, right? Yep. Final victory of the people of Israel are going to turn back. They're going to kick out or, or the king and the queen are actually going to change their minds or they're going to get kicked out and they're going to be revival. Mm-hmm. He's gone from that to run for your life because not only uh, are they still in power, but she's going to ramp, she's ramping up her oppression of you. Yeah. So he runs and runs and runs and runs and eventually ends up at Mount Sinai, which is way, way in the south. He's alone there, and Mount Sinai is where God gave the law. And so he says, that's it. It's just going to be me and God. We're gonna go, I'm going to go over the mountain. I'm going to live with him. So he sits in a cave, and then there you have this story of God coming to him and saying, uh, what are you doing here, yeah. Elijah? And then Elijah says, oh, I, I'm here because of all, nobody's following you anymore, and I'm the only one left. And then the Lord comes in, uh, or, or there's a, there's an earthquake and a fire and like, you know, and finally a small whisper. And then the Lord asks him again, what are you doing here, Elijah? Mm-hmm. And he says the same thing. I'm here, whatever. And so a lot of people have been like, well, what in the world is going on between the two questions that the Lord asks, what in the world's going on with these three, you know, the earthquake, the fire and the whisper, some people take that and they're like, oh, see the God, it's a still small voice of the spirit. And then we talk about how we or he's hear a very that personal God. He's a personal God. But actually in the context of what's going on, it's basically God coming and saying to Isaiah, or sorry, to, to, to Elijah, I, I know that you expected me because the, the story says that God was not in the fire. It's not in the earthquake. He was in, you know, it's a still small voice. Mm. I know you expected fire and earthquake, man. I know that. Like that, you think that I'm going to come in these big, ma- massive, momentous moments, but I'm in the quiet. I'm doing a work that's quiet behind the scenes. And, you know, he at the later, he says, I've still kept 7,000. You're not the only one. I kept, I've kept 7,000 back from bowing their knee to bail. So even in the midst of all, you think the whole country's against it. There's actually other people out there that I'm, that I've held back that I've actually are mine mm-hmm. and you can't see them right now. I know that. And I know that in the face of it, everything's going wrong, but I, this is the way I do my work. It's not quite momentous and, and getting dominion over everything all the time. We pray for that, but most oftentimes God does his, does his work in the quiet. And of course, brother, you, like, you think about that. Where, I mean, where's Jesus born? The quietest town. Right. Uh, and who, who gets, who's, in, who's it announced to? Uh, a bunch of shepherds in the quiet. Yeah. Like, I, there's, and he, who sees him? 
uh, the like, who's the first one to find the resurrection? Two right. women who don't have a voice. Right. And yeah. so it's just uh, the God. God has always been doing His work in ways that we don't expect. And so even in the face of great hardship and difficulty, uh, we can say, "Well, I'm going to stay faithful to God and trust that He actually is working out His purposes uh, in our time, mm-hmm. even if I can't see it." Yeah. And so I mean, I guess the application of that is it looks like it's getting worse and worse in Canada, and maybe it is and the United States, but then you see this amazing thing happening in, in Asia. Yeah. Right? And you Where also you hear a still small, you hear that you, like you see the still yeah. small work of God going on in very quiet locations mm-hmm. as local church pastors continue to proclaim the word and God saves people mm-hmm. through that means. And, you know, uh, of course we, we pray for all the nations to come to faith in Christ and they will eventually, mm-hmm. uh, t- you know, submit all of them will, right? He's yeah. the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But in the meantime, we try to remain faithful despite who's sitting on the thrones of our land. Yeah. That's a good word. Yep. Look, we have time for one more here topic, Jeff. Uh, you preached on, we're in Jude now. What kind of, how many Judes can you think of? Jude Law. Wow. Uh, Judy Bloom. Jude, <laughs> is she an author? Jude Bloom? I know, I know a little lovely, Jude. a lovely little guy named Jude. Do you? Yeah. He's one of my favorite little kids. Yeah. Yeah. So I know a few Judes. Uh, but anyways, you were preaching through that, and this is your second sermon. Yeah. Uh, false teaching. Well, first, is there anything that you didn't get to say? But then, look, if you, we're going to get the oh, false teaching plenty, thing, because I, I got some rapid fire around for there's you There's some plenty teaching. of stuff. There's plenty of stuff that will be said as we go through this. Okay, okay rapid fire rapid on fire. false teaching. Yeah. False teaching, rapid fire. We need like a theme song. Okay, ready? Dun, 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 dun. All right, go. Begin. Okay, what are some of the most prevalent false teachings that we see rapid fire the prosperity gospel and uh, the, re- the the elimination of repentance from uh, any kind of gospel presentation or talk of sin as being an affront against a holy god and something that needs to be repented of in in, in the west mm-hmm. yeah what else anyone else oh, I'm sure there's others hell? yeah but that's part of the judgment thing we don't okay. like talking about sin judgment that sort of thing uh, those those things we like talking about people you know Jesus came to fulfill our purpose to give us purpose, to give us a destiny, that sort of stuff. We don't want to talk about how people will need to repent of a sin. We want to just talk about them adding Jesus on as some sort of amulet or necklace that gets them to... Powers. Uh, yeah, well, that gets them the, the, yeah, the power to achieve all their dreams and yeah. that sort of stuff. That's not the gospel. It's a mm. false one. Okay. Next one. Um, you often... So you will see uh, churches filled with people... And the, the teacher is a false teacher. Okay. Can what be. Is, what is the, so let's say this is like blatant prosperity teacher. Sure. Um, what is the spirit's role in that? Because what if there are other Christians, like true yeah, there Christians? Are. There are truly true Christians in those so settings. So why is the spirit like allowing that to happen? Well, Deuteronomy 13 is my answer to any time you're going to ask me, why does the spirit allow false teaching to mm-hmm. flourish in a place? It's because the Lord is putting people to the test. So you talked about a winnowing work or a, a wheat and chaff work. I think that that's what, that's what false teaching does to the church. Just so you know, there's, we, we actually should be kind of, in this weird way, the church should be thankful for false teaching because it's through the teaching of false doctrine that the true doctrine is clarified. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So the church has had to get together when Arius shows up and says, look, God, Jesus is not an eternal being. You know, he's just, a, he's just like the highest created being. And we end up making decisions that we, we get together and say, well, wait a minute, what does the Bible have to say about that? And so we are able to clarify all that and we write creeds out about it that we actually confess today about those sorts of things. So it, as much as I don't like false teaching and it's sad and I don't want it around, God actually, it does serve a purpose of the church. It does serve a kind of clarifying work of the church. If somebody brings up a kind of teaching that's alien to the Bible, it's, it's through pushing back against it and clarifying what the scriptures say that we come to a deeper understanding of how God's revealed himself in his word. Awesome. Okay. Next question. Uh, isn't everyone a little bit of a false teacher? Yes. Well, if you talk about false, I want to make a distinction between false and faulty though. Okay. Right. So false teacher is somebody who denies Christ's lordship. So I'm using language of Jude four there who denies Christ's lordship through either their doctrine or through their life. And they espouse others to do the same. And so I, what I'm saying there is that they reject some of the core teaching, core parts of the biblical uh, story or the core parts of the biblical doctrine, okay? okay. Uh, faulty teachers are those who 
disagree on what I'd call secondary issues, that ones that are not central to the gospel message, right? But, but are, there's probably a biblical right, there's a biblical right and wrong on them. Baptism is a good example of that. Somebody, we can disagree on baptism. So if I, if, if a, if a reformed person or a Presbyterian person is right, the babies ought to be baptized, then I'm wrong, mm-hmm. right? So you call me a false teacher because I don't think that that's the case. But I don't think the word false teacher is the right word for that. I think that probably faulty teacher faulty. is there. Because yeah. they're not preaching a false gospel. No, no. That's no. A good there's lots of there's lots of subjects like that, I think, that that are around. But the ones that are closer to the center of who God is, how we understand like the the character of God and how the and and you know uh, the, the nature of the gospel itself. That's why I'm bringing up stuff having to do with judgment or mm-hmm, mm-hmm. atonement or that sort of thing or repentance. These things all have to do with like the actual central gospel message. Yeah. Okay. What about if someone just like has misspoke? Oh yeah. Uh, that we just consider that just faulty. I just say yeah. You made a yeah, mistake. Made a mistake. You know, a good a good teacher is willing to be be shown that they're that what they said was not true. Yeah. Right, because we all make mistakes by what we say, and then we have somebody comes along who clarifies. I thank God for them, yeah. who come on and clarify the the sign. But that's that teachability, right? Yeah. Okay, here we go. Here's another one. What about singing songs from churches that have false yeah, teachers? Man. Yeah. What about that? Well, I don't think the false teacher itself repudiates a song, right? The song could be great. Actually, to be honest with you, I have some serious, serious reservations about some some of the pastors of some of the churches that write the most songs. Yeah. But I think the songs themselves are rich and uh, quite excellent. Which and is a funny do- how that works true. Out. Well, I mean, I know, so I've actually, I know some of the people and I'm thinking in my mind about one particular church, but I know some people who write songs for that church. Yeah. And uh, they, what the songs that they write are, are biblically informed uh, and they're, really they're not espousing the viewpoints of the speaker or the preacher so much as they're espousing the viewpoints of their Sunday school teachers that taught them in other churches when they were growing up. Do you understand? Yeah. yeah. So I, I don't want to judge, you know, this is not guilt by association type thing, right? Oh, well you go to a church that's like this, therefore everything you do is horrible. Well, that's not true. And there are some things that some, you know, like there are some things that some, uh, a false teacher will say that are true. I think they did, we should have a nuanced understanding of that and say, actually that that point that they made is, is right. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't mean that the other stuff they're saying is right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you had a question for me. We were talking about before about false teachers. Uh, I gave up. Oh, you did? No, I forget it. Something about, I, okay, I'll try to remember it. You were saying, uh, <laughs> why, oh, should you so, name why are we so hesitant? Oh, naming names. Are we allowed to name names? Well, I think uh, Paul does. He does it in First Timothy uh, one and Second uh, Timothy two. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, is that a last leg thing? Like you, you want to be kind of vague oh, about yeah. it about the names, but eventually, if people aren't getting the hint, then yeah, you I just drop the name. The fear of not saying the names of people is that people aren't going to connect the dots regarding uh, the teaching itself. Whereas if you you say the name of the person, yeah. usually. Uh, if you say the name of the person, they're, they're, they do connect the dots. Usually what happens, though, in the scripture, so Jude is a good example. When he says, for certain individuals have come in, he's, he's speaking about some people that they know that they are common to them. They know who he's talking about. Yeah. If you don't know who we're talking about, then he, it probably would help to clarify. The problem with naming a name is that there are people sometimes who are listening to you who don't know anything about that particular person, and therefore... Uh, their interest is peaked and you've actually done a disservice to the truth by actually pointing a bunch of people to that person's ministry. And yeah. so now they go out and they listen to him and say, oh, he's not so bad. I like it. Yeah, it was actually really helpful to me. Right. Yeah. And so in the end, I, I, I don't like it. I don't like naming names. Yeah. That doesn't mean I haven't done it. And yeah. it doesn't mean I, I won't in the future. I just think it is absolutely a last resort and something that, uh, yeah, that it shouldn't be should be done probably not in the most public of places. I've had people write emails to me about it, and I every time I read their emails about it, and they're like critical of, hey, you should people should we shouldn't be naming names. I I there's a part of me that's like, yeah, I I totally, I get it. I understand your feelings about it. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you're saying why are we? This is the question. I think you so asked why is me. it that people are so open to false teaching in the church? Mike, that's that's my question. Yeah, that's question. Like, do why are people so surprised at this? I always I'm, I'm always yeah. uh, interested that why it is that people who sit in the pew or who, you know, come to church or whatever, they seem to be shocked when somebody mentions a false teaching. It's just because it sounds judgmental or like what, you know, I think part of it is... The scripture says that they're, they're going to be around all the time. Yeah. I think in our Canadian 
tolerant, kind, very polite society. I don't think we want to think bad of people in that way. We want to give them the benefit of the doubt. And so it's kind of a shock when you're like, actually, this person's Ill. what? No, they're really good. They're really nice. They're really kind. And well, so I think argued, we want to think that the the best of them. Nobody's arguing that they're not really nice, good, and kind. But, but that <laughs> translates over to why would they say anything false? Like yeah. why would they do anything mistrust? So I think just going into it, we have such a high view of people that uh, that I think we think if they, if someone, especially kind of you could say partly a celebrity culture, but also I think when someone's a lot of people have fear of public speaking. And when they see someone else do it really confidently, yeah. they're like, wow, this person's remarkable. Yeah, I think that sometimes you feel like they're your friends. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, I, yeah, I mean, here we are talking on a podcast and we share stories about our own lives. And so even though you might, you, you don't know me personally, there are people who will say, oh, no, I, I know Jeff and stuff. And so in, there's this kind of odd friendship that we have. Yeah. I think that happens with, with a lot of... Uh, a lot of teachers all over the place. So we, t- we feel like there it's more than just you're putting down somebody or you're some, somebody who, who I don't know. I do know them. I f- at least I feel like I do through the power of their stories or the mm-hmm. power of the presentation. And if you've been involved with someone's ministry for a long time, even 20 if, years, 30 years, yeah, right? then, you you're, then you're like, yeah. And then you've seen, you also are like, they've really helped me. Yep. And so if they've helped you th- therapeutically, uh, you're like, oh, that's, that's great. And you're, t- you're t- you tend to give, turn a blind eye towards some of the other stuff that they say, uh, especially if it's like really, really heretical. Mm -hmm. And in some cases it is, it's, it's just flat heresy, Mm -hmm. but because they, somebody was helped or because they, you know, uh, they feel like a friend or whatever, you end up not wanting to actually engage. I think, unfortunately, uh, and I was just thinking there, there there's this part of, uh, in second Peter, where the elders of the church are told to, like if there's an accusation that's brought against an elder, I think it's maybe it's First Timothy 5, I can't remember. But if there's an accusation that's brought against an elder, you need to have two or three witnesses. But there's this portion where it's like, you know, you need to um, don't show any favoritism yeah. at the end. So like the reason he's saying that is, hey, the temptation you're going to have is that when somebody accuses an elder of a particular thing, you're going to want to protect the elder because you're a buddy. Mm. But you can't show favoritism. If there are two or three people bringing an accusation against an elder, you should take it seriously. Because listen, again, Paul's like, from your own number <laughs> are going to arise savage wolves. Mm-hmm. So don't be surprised if people turn away from the faith. I Listen, a dear friend of mine uh who in New Zealand, it really was. We spent time together with his family and whatever. After I left, uh, he was he was an elder of the church and he ended up espousing a kind of what we call oneness Pentecostalism where he 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 denied certain significant parts of tr- Trinitarian theology, yeah. which is a huge deal. And even after dialogue and trying to correct correct him and all that sort of stuff, that he he ended up wanting to insist that the church follow down that path. He was trying to actually bring in other teachers who held his viewpoints. He was having some visit from the United States, and they were trying to win the mind of the church. And the elders had to take their friend and and put him under church discipline. He ended up leaving, leaving the church in a huff and getting all frustrated and this sort of thing. But I. But they did right, yeah. and I again and they, I still can the the my right? heart my heart hurts still. Yeah. I pray for him. I pray the Lord would grant him repentance. Yeah. But because, but he's been he's been duped <laughs> to yeah. believe something that is contrary to sound doctrine, and yeah. this is this is the challenge. Mm-hmm. I mean, the way I rationalize that partly too is he he's now believing in a different God, right? Wouldn't you say? Like right. He's believing in something yeah. that's not actually who God has claimed to be. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, we could keep going on this, but we are, this is one of our longer episodes. Uh-oh. But we wanted to do that for the people because it's episode 350. 50. 350. <laughs> so, thanks Je- thanks Daniel. Happy birthday. Thanks. Jeff, you can sing for me now? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for listening to the extra podcast. If you have any questions, you can send those in and join us next week when Jeff will sing happy birthday to me on the podcast. <laughs>